Hello and welcome to I Know Dino. I'm Garrett. And I'm Sabrina. And today in our 442nd episode, we have two new dinosaurs, or maybe one new dinosaur and one new dinosaur morph. Depends how you classify it. Yep. What you think of Silosaurs specifically. <laughs> We also have a really exciting interview with Anje and Kara, who worked on the soundscape for Prehistoric Planet both seasons one and two. And season two is coming out real soon. It is. So we're celebrating with the interview. It's really interesting. They even made instruments for the production. It's so cool. And played us some instruments. Oh, yeah. You'll hear a little bit of that in the interview. And we have Dinosaur of the Day, Zalmoxes, which we've talked a little bit about before, but never done as a Dinosaur of the Day. But before we get into all that, as always, we'd like to thank some of our patrons for helping to make the podcast possible. And this week, we have two new patrons to thank. They are Linda and Adrian. Thank you both for joining. They both joined separately. It's not Linda and Adrian. It's Linda. (laughs) And also Adrian joined, (laughs) which is awesome. We really appreciate it. We couldn't make the podcast without new people joining. Yes. And also without the continued support of existing patrons. So we have eight more patrons to thank, and they are Stijakasaurus, Christine, Stephanie, Danny Hermes, Dang, Histologysaurus, Dino Dork, and Lawrence. Yes, thank you so much. As Garrett mentioned, we cannot keep doing this podcast without your support. So thank you for being part of our community. Jumping into the news, I get to start because mine is definitely a new dinosaur. (laughs) Unequivocally a dinosaur, not a dinosaur morph. Yep. There's a new pachycephalosaur called Platytholus clemensi. This was published in the Journal of Vertebrate Paleontology by John, Jack Horner, Mark Goodwin, and David Evans. Well, that's a pretty all-star cast. Yeah. I might have read it as Platytholus, but I'm not sure. I guess it's plat like platypus. <laughs> that was my thinking. So pachycephalosaurs, of course, are known for their domed heads. And in this case, what the authors found was a partial skull. Platytholus lived in the late Cretaceous in what is now Montana. It was found in the Hell Creek Formation. It's a popular one. It is. And it helped show pachycephalosaurs were more diverse than we previously thought. And maybe they were even in ecological niches based on their size. So first what they did was they compared the Platytholus skull with Spherotholus and Pachycephalosaurus. They're also from Hell Creek. And they found enough differences to name a new dinosaur. And they found that Platytholus was somewhere in between Spherotholus and Pachycephalosaurus size-wise. Now as you're describing this, I'm thinking when we said it was definitely a new dinosaur... It makes me wonder, all we have is the bump on its head, <laughs> the skull dome, and sometimes those get synonymized, so I wonder if it might get synonymized. Well, what's interesting is in the paper, the authors predict we'll find more new types of pachycephalosaurs in the future, even in areas like Hell Creek, where we're pretty familiar with the types of dinosaurs that are there. Hmm. But for this case, they said there are long ghost lineages in pachycephalosaurs, and that implies that there's more diversity in this group than we currently know. Even though their skull features, like those domes and everything, they make it easier to identify them compared to other small ornithischian dinosaurs. I say this is all interesting because they also mention that they still believe Stygimola to be a sub-adult pachycephalosaurus. So they're kind of lumping and splitting here. Okay. That might give them a little more credibility as not just splitting everything out. Right. Because in other cases, they're like, oh, these should be actually lumped. Yeah. So we'll see. I mean... You never know what future papers, what future studies might find. In this case, they found Platytholus, the skull, did not belong to a juvenile. It was in a later growth stage. That definitely helps. Yes. And in terms of sizes, because I said it was in between Spherotholus and Pachycephalosaurus, Spherotholus is estimated to be about 6.6 feet or 2 meters long, and Pachycephalosaurus is estimated to be almost 15 feet or about 4.5 meters long. So it's somewhere in between those. (laughs) Between 2 and and 4.5 meters? Yeah. They also found Platytholus to be more closely related to Prenocephaly, which was found in Mongolia in the Nemet Formation, than dinosaurs in North America. And thus the ghost lineage. Mm Mm-hmm. 
So as I mentioned, they found part of the dome, and it had a low, wide dome and, quote, unique imbricated roof tile-like ornamentation. Imbricated? Yes. It basically means that there's overlapping edges of roof tile-like ornamentation on the top of the skull. (laughs) That does sound like roof tiles. It does. And that's what the authors mean by it should be easy to figure out the different types of pachycephalosaurs because they've got these unique things going on with their skull. That does sound unique. I've never heard of that before in really any animal skull. Yeah. Doesn't mean it's not in an animal skull, but not (laughs) ones we've talked about. (laughs) There are some pathologies on the skull. It seems there was some kind of break. And as they put it, there's some bone tissue that was expelled from the top of the skull, probably from an injury. Yikes. Yeah. In the paper they talk about, you could see tissues filling in and you can tell that there were missing bits before those tissues started to repair. So they said, quote, this would be the first unequivocal evidence of trauma in a pachycephalosaur dome due to the nature of the fracture and subsequent healing, end quote. So then the question obviously is, did it happen from headbutting? Right. They did suggest it could have been from head to head pushing or shoving or headbutting. Wow. But that's a... They said, even though there's definitely trauma to the top of the skull, quote, to imply that it is the result of headbutting without evidence from internal and external examination of bone tissue in a more comprehensive approach is a fool's errand. (laughs) That's in the paper. That's in the paper. They also said, quote, it's time to stop trying to force a specific behavioral trait onto pachycephalosaurids without a comprehensive examination of all of their various cranial characteristics, end quote. So don't rush into the, it must have been a headbutting thing. Yeah. Idea, yeah. We have seen people that tried to look at the whole head and neck and basically came to the conclusion of like, it would have broken its neck if Mm -hmm. it butted heads. But then we've seen other comparisons where they look at the head and they say, well, it's got some pretty good either cushioning or just a thick skull roof and it maybe could have headbutted or at least butted flanks or something. So yeah, the jury's still out on that. Yeah. It'd be interesting if this specimen helps in the future though. Yeah, that'd be cool. I'm every piece helps. Yeah. (laughs) Seems like a very good puzzle piece. Yeah. They also found that based on features at the top of the skull and the highly vascularized bone, The surface of the dome may have had some sort of structure on top of it. It wasn't just some simple keratin cap. Yeah, like a fleshy padding (laughs) for (laughs) headbutting. So as I mentioned, they found a partial skull, specifically the top middle part. It's a medium-sized pachycephalosaurid skull. And the genus name, in case you're wondering, platytholus means wide, small, domed hill. And the species name Clemensi is in honor of Dr. William A. Clemens for his significant contributions to vertebrate paleontology. Nice. That sounds like a good one. Yeah. At first when you said, oh, we've got a pachycephalosaur and all we have is the dome Mm -hmm. or part of the dome, I was thinking, well, that's not that exciting. But it's an important part for a pachycephalosaur. Yeah. Get those imbricated roof tile like <laughs> ornamentation. Yep. And then also, <laughs> there's something on top of that skull. And it looks like it was broken a little bit too. Mm. That's very interesting. Yeah. And it's from the Hell Creek, which is most people's favorite formation, other than maybe the Morrison might be. It's a, it's a close second. <laughs> <laughs> Nemet's pretty good too. It is. I've got another potentially new dinosaur which was published in Scientific Reports by Rodrigo T. Mueller and others. And the reason I say it's a potential new dinosaur is because it's a dinosaur morph, a silosaur. Although, according to some people, silosaurs are dinosaurs. That's why we included this one. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes we talk about dinosaur morphs if they're really interesting, because dinosaur morphs are the larger, broader group, which includes dinosaurs. So if Silosaurs are considered to be true dinosaurs. They're still dinosaur morphs. It's just like a more specific type of dinosaur morph. Silosaurs are, quote, the oldest dinosaur morphs reported in the fossil record, end quote, which means that if silosaurs are in fact true dinosaurs and not just dinosaur morphs, they would also be the oldest known dinosaurs. The most recent two studies I've seen consider silosaurs to be dinosaurs and not just dinosaur morphs. So, yeah, that is why. I decided to talk about this one. But yeah, we started with the less controversial dinosaurs since it's definitely a dinosaur. <laughs> yes, pachycephalosaurs are have long considered to be dinosaurs. Yeah, as far as I know, no one has ever said pachycephalosaurs, not real dinosaurs, especially since they're pretty late 
This is a Triassic creature. The Stylosaur? Mm Mm-hmm. The other fun thing about that is usually the oldest dinosaurs are considered to be Saurischians, but if Stylosaurs are dinosaurs, that means the oldest dinosaurs that we know of are Ornithischians, jumping back tens of millions of years earlier than the previously known oldest Ornithischians. And Saurischians are, we generally think of sauropods and theropods. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of sauropodomorphs from the Triassic and theropods. The oldest Silosaurs are from South America and Africa. They've been found in Brazil, Argentina, Tanzania, and Zambia. All of those are from the Middle Triassic. Again, even though it's the Middle Triassic, it's in the first half of the Triassic due to the weird naming conventions. Right, because the Late Triassic is most of the Triassic. Yep. (laughs) That's very strange. (laughs) Because we found the earliest Silosaurs from the southern hemisphere. We think that Silosaurus probably evolved in Gondwana, the landmass of all the southern continents back in the Triassic. But by the late Triassic, there were Silosaurus in North America and Europe, so they didn't just stay in the southern hemisphere. They moved pretty quickly. Yeah, tens of millions of years. <laughs> <laughs> It'd be fun to convert that speed because you figure they go like 10,000 miles in 10 million years. Hmm. What is that? Like a fraction of a mile an hour, if you average it out, or a mile a year? (laughs) Well, when you break it down like that. (laughs) The new Silosaur is named Amanosaurus nesbidae. The genus name Amanosaurus comes from the Tupi word amana, which means rain. Is nesbidae sterling nesbit? It is, yes. He does a lot of work with Triassic animals. Yeah, they said the species name, quote, honors Dr. Sterling J. Nesbitt, a prominent North American paleontologist, for his contribution and studies of silosaurs and Triassic archosaurs, end quote. So not only does he study silosaurs, but he has studies other Triassic dinosaur morphs and even more distant things that are just in archosaurs, even broader group that includes pterosaurs. So the name Amana that tupi word meaning rain is because a monosaurus is from the carnian pluvial event or carnian pluvial episode and pluvial means rain so mm. it rained a lot and thus rain lizard <laughs> is its name not it's raining lizards no it was although kind of in a way because it is the time in the triassic when dinosaurs pterosaurs and mammals really got going so it was sort of raining new dinosaur species in a way <laughs> <laughs> and then not surprisingly they think it's from the carnian given that it was in the carnian pluvial event and the carnian in this case this part of the carnian is about 233 million years ago which is very old for a dinosaur yes this amanosaurus has quote the oldest occurrence of an anterior trochanter separated by the femoral shaft by a marked cleft end quote and what does that mean Basically, the anterior trochanter is an important muscle attachment spot at the top front of the femur, Hmm. and several muscles from the hip and upper leg attach to it and basically help with moving the leg around in the hip socket. So it's an important feature to have on the femur for mobility. Yeah. And we've seen, I think theropods also had it early on, so it's a pretty dinosaur-like feature. The authors say, quote, its femoral length indicates that the new species rivals in size with most coeval dinosaurs, end quote. So that's dinosaurs that lived around the same, oh no. Yeah. Yeah, around the same time. Or like we're evolving around the same time. I said, oh no, because I was remembering this is a silosaur and we're in the middle Triassic and (laughs) we generally talk about dinosaurs a little bit later in the late Triassic. Yeah, This dinosaur is from the late Triassic. The Carnian is the very beginning of the late Triassic. Oh, okay. But there are those other silosaurs I was talking about that I didn't name were from the middle Triassic. Got it. So even though they're talking about the femoral length, they couldn't exactly measure the length of the femur. The holotype is only the very top of the femur with that fancy trochanter. The piece that they found is 25 millimeters long, and they estimate that the total length of the femur was about 122 millimeters long. So that's like about a fifth, 20% of the bone, what Mm -hmm. they found. And when you look at pictures of it, it even looks like less than that. It's such a small little piece. And in inches, that's one inch out of 4.8 inches. And 4.8 inches is not particularly long for a femur. Nope. 
There is a referred specimen of the other end of the femur, which is a little bit bigger. They found 36 millimeters of that oh. <laughs> out of an estimated 143 millimeters, meaning 1.4 inches out of 5.6 inches. But still, 5.6 inches is not particularly impressive for a dinosaur. No. They got those estimates by comparing the fragments of these femurs to 31 femora from different archosaurs from the Triassic and early Jurassic. They think it was probably quadrupedal, although there are no front limbs or anything other than the femur to work with. So we can guess that it's a silosaur based on some of the details of these little femur fragments, and that's really about it. The femur of a monosaurus was about the same size as the early sauropodomorph Burialestes, and Burialestes is estimated at about 1.5 meters or 5 feet long. A monosaurus might be similar, given that its femur is similar. Mm-hmm. And there wasn't a whole lot of different crazy stuff going on in dinosaur body plans in the Triassic. There was, you know, they were all vaguely similar, not like when you get to the Cretaceous and there's all sorts of super weird stuff going on, or even Jurassic. Burialestes was only found about half a kilometer from a monosaurus, which means that they likely lived alongside each other. And as the authors point out previously, it's been proposed that silosaurs were kept small in ecosystems when living alongside dinosaurs, or maybe I should say other dinosaurs, if silosaurs count as dinosaurs. Mm -hmm. That's not too different from how mammals have been described in the Mesozoic as staying small to fill those niches that dinosaurs weren't filling because the dinosaurs were on all the big <laughs> yep. niches. Filling the niches, biding their time. Yep. However, a monosaurus... And this new find throws that off a bit because it was about the same size as sauropodomorphs and herrerasaurids that lived at that same time. And they also don't think that it shrank in size during the Triassic. So it's not like they started out big and then they had to shrink to live alongside dinosaurs. They seem to be evolving totally separately and coexisting somehow, although they did go extinct around the Triassic-Jurassic boundary, along with a lot of other stuff when dinosaurs really ratcheted up the diversity. Mm. Well, I hope we keep thinking that silosaurs were dinosaurs because that opens up a whole world of possibilities. Me too. And it helps explain the whole weird no ornithischians in the Triassic thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they were there all along. <laughs> yeah. Although some of their analyses, it's like they're ornithischians, but they didn't evolve into the modern ornithischians, which doesn't really help then because then you just have a different ghost lineage. Well, take what we can. Mm -hmm. And in just a moment, we'll get on to our interview with the prehistoric planet soundscape creators, but first we're going to pause for a quick sponsor break. And now on to our interview with Anjay and Kara, but as always, we got going on all sorts of topics, <laughs> so we have an extended version of this interview for our patrons, so if you are a patron, make sure to check out your premium content feed. We are joined this week by Anjay Roseman and Kara Talvi. And they are two of the composers from the collective at Bleeding Fingers Music. They, along with Oscar-winning composer Hans Zimmer, recently created the soundscape for Apple TV Plus and BBC's Prehistoric Planet. They won the Hollywood Music and Media Award for Best Score for Stream Documentary, and they're nominated for at least a couple other awards because the sound is fantastic in that documentary. Thank you both so much for joining us. Thanks for having us. When you were coming up with a score, did you watch, had they already recorded scenes or what was the process like? Like how much information did you have about what you were scoring? Well, in the spotting session, we would go through the scenes and how they're going to change and evolve over time because obviously it's CGI. So most of it was in pretty rough stages when we would first start scoring. So our conversations with the showrunners were very important to fill in the blanks and explain what's going to change over time. But yeah, we kind of had to use our imaginations for a lot of it. What do you think, Anje? Well, yeah, as you said, like the so-called spotting sessions that we call them in the biz is uh, <laughs> nowadays they look like that we jump on a Zoom call with the, with the producers of the show. And, you know, we watch the episode together and they convey the story arcs of each of the scenes to us. So as far as I understand how the whole animation process works, there's artists for doing concept art. And then that leads into like storyboards. And that leads into another animation team doing 
rough animations on CGI landscape. And then a film crew is out and about on planet Earth filming locations. So then when they have that, then MPC takes over and then they do the final animations and put the dinosaurs into the landscape that the film crew filmed around planet Earth. So <laughs> what's the uh, one of our favorite things with Kara was that sometimes we would just get storyboards. You know, like three frames per second, a dino doing something, and then you know what the story is, so you fill in the blanks. But uh, the most fun part, I think, for us with the visual side is when we just got the visuals back from the film crew. So instead of like real triceratopses walking around in the cave in the forest episode, there were three people with giant triceratops <laughs> cutouts walking in that cave. Uh, yeah. And that, that must be one of the best jobs for uh, <laughs> dino fans, <laughs> being yeah. a triceratops cutout. <laughs> or like if a dinosaur um, bites off a, uh, a branch, instead of a dinosaur head, they would just have a, a man or a woman in a glove, you know, <laughs> prodding at a tree. Yeah. Um, so there's like a lot of fun things like that. That is hilarious. That we get to see. Yeah, and the guy on the motorbike, they need to infer what the speed the dinosaurs were running <laughs> was. So they'd have, like, someone on a motorcycle riding down a hill. <laughs> yeah, so, like, the first, the, first, cool. the first cut we would get, it would be just the motorcycle. <laughs> and then the, second, the next cut, it would be a motorcycle and already, like, some temp dinos running beside him. <laughs> and then the motorcycle would slowly get deleted throughout the, you know, next generation of cuts we would get. <laughs> yeah, but the most fun thing is to see the end result, which usually for us is after post-production. Mm. I mean, after we've even done the music, when you see it all come together and you're like, holy, shit, that looks really cool. <laughs> and season, <laughs> season two looks even more amazing, in my opinion. So can you tell us like how far along are you? Are you done with your music already for season two or is it? As far as we're concerned, I think we're done with the music. But in our profession, you're never really done until it's on screen. Mm. So there's still a chance that something might, might come in. Until it's on TV, we're not done. Gotcha. Yeah. Because I was wondering, when you're talking about the motorcycle thing, I feel like a lot of times when things are scored, they're sort of paced like the footsteps of the animals, especially if something's kind of running. There might be some sort of connection between how how fast its legs are moving versus the beat of the music. Did you have the ability to do that kind of stuff? That's actually mine and Kara's thing that we always want to, we're always proud of ourselves if we, if we manage to hit the footsteps <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> in a subtle way. Yeah. So did you have to like rework it as the animation came through ever? Vaguely remember that sometimes if there weren't dinosaurs on screen yet, they might animate a little bit to the music. I, I vaguely remember that. Didn't we send some scenes and we got it back and we realized, oh, they kind of <laughs> animated what we did here. Yeah, what, what we have to say is that, at least for me personally, out of any project that I've worked on, this was the most satisfying one and also the most organized one. How well the teams were organized between each other is absolutely crazy. So from our process... We had about six to eight weeks per episode to do the first version of the episode. The first version meaning that it's not the first version of the music. So we would send scenes over to the producers and we would get feedback and feedback and feedback and feedback. And over several versions, we would conclude, OK, this is version, the real version one of this episode, <laughs> scored on a pretty rough cut. And then we would park that for a few months. What happens between those few months, we don't really know. So we are guessing, I mean, they put our, they replace our original score with the previous demo score that was in. And I'm guessing that the animators take that into account and probably animate to our score as well. Hmm. 
And then we get, after a few months, we would get the pre-lock and we would do final corrections on timing. And then we would go record with an orchestra. And then the lock picture would come in and then our music editor would come in and we would fix the final timings again. Minute things. But yeah, as Kara said, we believe that the animators do sometimes animate to our score. <laughs> At least there was like few instances where I don't remember where, where we were like, oh, we don't remember hitting that. <laughs> but, you know, they yeah. might have done a slight different eye movement of the of a dino mm. or footsteps or whatever. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. I know you built custom instruments. Could you tell us a little bit about that? I, I heard you use some fossils and fossilized rock and things like that. I mean, you have them in there. You should <laughs> show. <laughs> How the story of the creation of these instruments goes is that we wanted to portray, well, the whole production wanted to portray dinosaurs as majestic and glorious and just normal animals. But on the other hand, there's this mystique and otherworldliness about them because they're all dead and it's mysterious and it's magical. So the live orchestra that we had, we knew we would have the ability to record with the BBC Symphony Orchestra of Wales. And that brings this homely, familiar territory to the score, hmm. like planet Earth or, or Blue Planet, you know. You're familiar with those sounds and you're immediately, it tricks your brain into thinking, oh, I'm watching a normal animal documentary. Yeah. And then these, we were trying to find sounds that would convey the other aspect of it, the otherworldliness, the mysterious part of it. And uh, Hans Zimmer and Andrew James Christie, who did the main theme for the show, they enlisted Gorkim Sen, who plays this instrument he made called the Yabahar that's heard in the beginning of the main theme and also throughout the score. And we were all, you know, we were all like, wow, this, this really sounds otherworldly. It gives a really cool aspect to the soundscape. But we, we knew we wanted more and we wanted some instruments that would convey more our story. So me and Kara took a trip to Sedona in December of 2020. And there we stumbled upon a Native American trading post. And in this room, there were bones of various animals from coyotes to alligators to turtles, uh, you name it, they had it. But also mm -hmm. fossils and some like meteorite fragments and Native American instruments. So that's when it kind of clicked for us. So why don't we try to use these materials to create the instruments for the show? So we bought a bunch of bones <laughs> and some fossils, petrified wood, and we brought it back. And then this is not the prototype, but this is the first instrument that we got back from the shop from uh, Charles Lebrecht, Chaz, who has been building instruments for Hans for years. <laughs> but what we did is we had a deer bone and we just strung a cello string over it and put a cheap contact mic on it and ran it through some guitar pedals. And the sound is creepy and weird. And it's really something that we've, we've never heard before. So we knew that we had something that we can work with. So this is the Raptor violin that's, that we use for a lot of our dromaeosaurs and it's also elasmosaurs and stuff. That's awesome. <laughs> that is great. And I know that this one is heavily featured in the second track on the soundtrack, right? Yeah. Which you can yeah. find on Spotify and Apple Music. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> yeah, called, I think, Dromaeosaurs. Yeah. But anyway, to conclude my long story, make it short ending, this was the first instrument called the Raptor Violin, and then we also... Well, we said, this is cool, and we had a baby cello, so we decided to put a moose bone on it, <laughs> and that became the hadro cello used for the hadrosaurs. And FYI for anyone wanting to know, all the bones in that shop are sustainably sourced, or just from their, you know, I think the Navajo Nation 
just their general hunting. You know, nothing goes to waste. No animals were harmed in the making of these. No animals were. Yeah, we didn't go hunting moose just to create these instruments. And then we also created one of these raptor violins out of a Ice Age horse fossil that we bought. Oh, wow. Um, Ice Age horse tibia bone. We couldn't get a dinosaur. (laughs) Then we made some percussions out of petrified wood. Then just a few other instruments, the fat rex with the T-Rex skull on top, T-Rex replica skull that we use for our velociraptors. And uh, yeah. Wow. Then we recorded subcontra bass flute, which is another very cool instrument for the mosasaur. I don't know that one. So it's like eight feet tall. Oh, wow. It's absolutely humongous. So if you listen to the mosasaur track on the soundtrack. Mosasaur battle. Well, Mosasaur Spa and Moses uh, Kai Kai Filu, uh, those both feature the subcontra bass flute. So, in essence, we tried to find sounds that would go well with our characters, but also in a way have the listener go, oh, wait, what's that? Mm-hmm. No. Oh, nice orchestra. I feel comfortable. This is, I know what I'm watching. I'm watching Planet Earth with dinosaurs and then. You know, a second later, oh, wait, this is not this is not quite planet Earth. We're 66 million years ago. Yeah. Yeah. That, I think my exact feeling, the way you start the first episode where you have the nice orchestral music and then you have the Tyrannosaurus swimming. And I love that, too, because it makes the Tyrannosaurus seem like the friendly ones. And then this creepy yeah. music comes in and you're like, oh, the Mosasaurs <laughs> are the bad guys of this situation. But like you said, it's a different sound than you hear in other documentaries so it's you can tell that the mosasaur is like something special and extra oh yeah that's the first time you can hear the subcontra bass flute yeah 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 i love that scene well i really enjoyed the entire thing i think you guys did a fantastic job yes thank you thank you i guess i would like to ask about a few specific dinosaur and how you decided Mm -hmm. to score them if you're okay with that Mm -hmm. so i think the one that stands out the most when I talk about this show with people, the thing that they remember the most is the Carnotaurus with its little arms and how it was <laughs> sort of goofy, but you expected it to be a fight going into it because they're sort of approaching each other. How did you guys get that mood across? Well, when we first spotted that scene, that was a really hard one. That was a very specific request of we don't want it to be too funny or silly, but it still needs to be lighthearted and it's still a big dinosaur. So we need to feel that it's a big dinosaur. So it was really pretty hard, I recall. It was the first fully rendered scene. Mm-hmm. So I think that was that scene was kind of the pilot of the show. Yeah, they I remember they had been they were going to show that scene somewhere. It was some sort of example piece. And there needs to be this, like you said, this feeling in the beginning that it's going to be a fight. And then there's a big shift into this comedic kind of lighthearted thing. So, yeah, I think the first version was actually a bossa nova. <laughs> and yeah, the, it was. The director did not like that at all. <laughs> so <laughs> we shifted to a more lighthearted, silly kind of thing. But. Yeah, that scene was really funny, especially when you see the <laughs> the blue arms come out. And that was a that was a funny sync point with the music. Yeah, I remember when Kara was doing that scene and you know, we always listened to each other's stuff and Kara would help me out, I would help out Kara, uh, Hans and and Russell Emanuel, the score producer, you know, would chip in with their ideas. And with this specific the Carnotaurus scene, I remember we were watching it together and even though we've heard it a dozen million times, we would still laugh every time (laughs) the little hands came out. And so if you as the composer or the composing team, if you still have the correct reaction after hundreds of listens, you know that you probably did it right because then the audience will probably, the majority will have a similar reaction as well. Yeah. yeah. And then there's that big build at the end where you're wondering, is she gonna is she gonna go for it or not? And 
And then there's the big letdown when she's like, nah. <laughs> she just but you didn't do like the slide whistle sad after that. Yeah. <laughs> what also makes, I think, this scene so so loved by the audience is that Carnotaurus especially is that dinosaur that I found the Carnotaurus in the dinosaur magazine from 94. And it's, you know, that vicious red guy, like usually with blood on his uh, <laughs> on his feet or like devouring a hadrosaur or whatever. And here you're having it do the silliest little mating <laughs> dance, like a bird of paradise, you know. It's a complete 180 shift from what we thought of this animal as. Yes. I should ask another question about those instruments that you guys created and had created. How was it integrating them? Did you just give it to a cellist and you're like, here you go. Here's a version of a well, cello. <laughs> no, Anche is a, a... You can say it. I was trying not to say mediocre <laughs> cello. No, no, no. I, I would be honored if you said that. Yeah, so he's a mediocre cellist, but that also allows him to play instruments that are constructed similarly to a cello. So, And I can't play anything like with a string. So mediocre is a big compliment. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I can't play any of those instruments. I tried to play the raptor violin, and it's really not easy. So even though it has one string, and it looks kind of simple to play, it really is not. Because you have to apply so much pressure to actually get a sound out of it. Mm -hmm. But yeah, he's a pro at playing all of those instruments. I'm a mediocre cellist, but I am... You're a pro Fat Rex player. Well, not a pro. I am actually the best in the world <laughs> in playing the Raptor violin, Adro Cello, and Fat Rex. The absolute best. I haven't gotten an award for it, but yeah. <laughs> not yet. They haven't made a category just well, yet. I would be curious how a professional cellist like Tina Guo would play that. I if know. If it would be any, I don't know, if it would be... Better. It would yeah. definitely be better. <laughs> it might sound too much like a cello. <laughs> I mean, it would be different. Yeah. But it's it's like we created this these instruments and we were the first to play them. So I guess it makes it even more unique. And Kara's right. I am a very mediocre cellist. And I collect instruments from around the world and I'm terrible at playing all of them. But once I got rid of that fear... Because mind you, also my, my piano teacher in music high school like kind of disowned me and said that she's not going to prepare me for my uh, music college exams because <laughs> I'm not, I'm not going to bring shame to her name because I was not a very good piano player. So I, I, it always like kind of stuck with me that I, I suck at playing instruments and I still do. I don't, just don't have the motor skills for it. But then, then you just, it's still so liberating just to play stuff. And because I'm mediocre, I sometimes, not sometimes, I usually play not what I intend to. Hmm. And the key is to like then figure out, oh, I didn't mean to play this, but it sounds kind of cool. So that's kind of how the Velociraptor theme came about in on the Fat Rex, just out of improvisation. And we were like, well, this is cool. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't mean to play it. <laughs> and now you've won awards. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, not, well, not as a not pianist. Playing the <laughs> yeah. Could have been a factor. But, <laughs> they don't split out which instruments were the most important for the award. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. But yeah, it was cool to write a cue and then bring Ange in to play something over it or double the melody with one of the custom instruments. And it just makes, it brings it to that otherworldly sounding soundscape. Yeah. yeah, a lot of times it's very subtle where you wouldn't really notice it on the first listen. But even yeah. like we had Gorkham Sen on the Yabahar double a lot of lines that the orchestral violins and cellos are playing. Mm. And it's very like low in the mix, but it just gives the orchestra this magical flair that you haven't heard. Or the same as like the 
Hadro cello doubled with the cellos or the Raptor violins doubled with the violins. Mm. There's a lot of that in the score. Yeah. I wanted to ask real quick, the Fat Rex, you mentioned briefly what it was, and I think I missed, Is it? it's a percussion instrument, you said? Oh, no, wait, um, well, I'll show it to you. It can be because it does have a frame drum as the body. <laughs> mm. Oh, I see. It's like it looks almost like a, a mandolin. Yeah. Maybe is the closest instrument. <laughs> so this is it has the tyrannosaur skull. Oh, oh, I see. On it. It's not to scale. Yes. By the way. <laughs> so that's why he's the fat Rex. Gotcha. But this is the instrument that that's used for the Velociraptors. Okay. So it, mostly for our audio mm-hmm. listeners, it's like a three D printed or otherwise modeled skull that's like the size of your yes. hand at the top yeah chaz made right didn't chaz make that yes out of the printer yeah because usually the like normal in, uh, cellos and what whatever have the little uh, snail on top mm, mm-hmm. it's not a snail i don't know uh, what it's called but <laughs> in in like uh, baroque and renaissance uh, there was like an instrument called the uh, viola d'amore and it had an angel head on top um, but the Fat Rex is vaguely inspired by the Mongolian Morinkur, which is called the Mongolian, or even like I think the Horseman cello, and they have a horse head on top. So then Chaz was like, "Well, why don't we? Why don't I just 3D print a T Rex skull and put it on?" Top? <laughs> and it's it doesn't create any sound, but it does. Even just playing it, you know, you're playing something dinosaur. Yeah. Yeah. I love I love looking at the instrument, and it's fat because the the drum piece is enormous compared to the yes. <laughs> the scale of the rest of the instrument. Sort of like a it's fat, like P H A T. It's also very cool. Yes. <laughs> Going back real quick, I just I love how honest the two of you are with each other. Have you been working together for a long time? Well, we are getting married also. Oh, so yeah. Yeah. <laughs> perfect. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but we've been working together for years and we've been together through most of it. So, yeah. well, congratulations. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. I want to ask one last question, if I can, which is, are there any favorite pieces that you guys made that we didn't ask you about? Well, my personal favorite is the Velociraptor, the Canyon Hunt. Because of many different factors. Factor one, in preschool, we all loved dinosaurs. So we were playing dinosaurs and I was designated velociraptor chasing my friends around. (laughs) Uh, One friend was standing in front of a fence that went around the preschool and I was the velociraptor with with my claws out. Jumped on him, he moved and I crashed my head into the into the metal fence and I still have a scar on my eye to prove it. So I was always connected with the animal, (laughs) I guess. And then uh, just the fact that we got this Fat Rex instrument just when we were scoring the Velociraptor sequence and they wanted to portray the Velociraptors as smart and agile and calculative. And then this instrument just made them sound like that without us even trying. So it was a unique approach of scoring that. That's my favorite sequence in the show. And uh, I don't know about the music. I'm, I'm biased. But, <laughs> yeah, I just love the sequence. Yeah, I've always loved the Elasmosaurus and the Plesiosaurus. That's one of my favorite themes of the show. And also the bioluminescent ammonites. Mm-hmm. Which, mm-hmm. That scene is so different from kind of the rest of the score and the show because that's the only time we really introduced synths. So that particular sequence has a very cool sound, I think. Yeah, because they're like these they're like these aliens making light sixty six million years ago. It almost yeah. it, to us it almost seemed like they had this hidden technology that no <laughs> one else had at that time. So yeah. since since seen the right and if you watch closely, the synths really follow the movement of the electricity and their little tentacles. So that's something we paid close attention to. Cool. Awesome. So 
Last question for our listeners. If they wanted to find out more about you and your work, where's the best place where they, they might learn, maybe online? Well, both of our websites have information and, and tracks to listen to. Yes. Caratalvi.com. Anzerosman.com. <laughs> All right. A-N-Z-E. Well, and A-N-Z-E-R-O-Z-M-A-N.com. All right. Yeah. We'll put links into uh, our show notes, too, for anybody. Yes. Yay. Yeah. Great. Awesome. And buy the soundtrack on? Everywhere it's available. You said Spotify, Apple. Yeah, stream it on Spotify. And we can't, we can't wait for the season two soundtrack to, to come out and just, especially the show. Uh, we're in absolute love with the show and the whole team was yeah. so good to work with. It was just, it was just such a pleasant ride. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us. Thank you for inviting us. Thank you so much, Anjay and Kara. We had such a fun time talking with you. And thank you also, Anjay, for playing those instruments. We're really looking forward to season two of Prehistoric Planet. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And if you want to see photos of the instruments that we were talking about, we'll be sharing them on our website in the show notes, inodino.com. Oh, yeah, definitely check them out. It's hard to describe what exactly they look like, but they're really cool. And in just a moment, we'll get on to our dinosaur of the day, Zalmoxes. But first, we're going to pause for one last sponsor break. And now on to our dinosaur of the day, Zalmoxes, which was a request from PaleoMike716 via our Patreon and Discord. We did technically talk about Zalmoxes back in episode 400 because it was one of the many hot seg dinosaurs. But when I was looking through my notes, I realized, oh, I could go a lot deeper. <laughs> you just scratched the surface. <laughs> yep. <laughs> So Zalmoxis was a rhabdodontid ornithopod that lived in the late Cretaceous in what is now Romania in the Hatseg Basin. And rhabdodontids were ornithopods that lived in the late Cretaceous in what is now Europe when Europe was a chain of islands. Zalmoxis looked like a typical ornithopod, kind of like a guanodon but smaller. It walked on two legs, it had long arms, a long tail, and elongated skull. And the head was large and triangular and there was a beak. It was herbivorous, and it may have eaten tough plants like horsetails and ferns. There's two species of Zalmoxis, Zalmoxis robustus and Zalmoxis shipororum. The type species is Zalmoxis robustus. Now, Zalmoxis subadults have been found on Hatseg Island, and they range from 6.6 .6 to 7.9 feet, or 2 to 2.4 meters long. Doesn't sound that robust. <laughs> Zalmoxis shipororum was stockier and larger than Robustus, ironically. <laughs> There's one Zalmoxis shiporum that was found, a subadult that was found that was 8.2 feet or two and a half meters long. Only a little bit bigger then. Yep. There is one juvenile Zalmoxis found that's nine and a half feet or 2.9 meters long though. Interesting. Yes. Especially because it's a hot seg dinosaur, so it has been thought to be a dwarf dinosaur, but not everybody agrees with this. Twist. Mm hmm In 2009, Zoltan Siski and others questioned whether the hot seg dinosaurs were really dwarf dinosaurs, and they did histology on the long bones of Zalmoxis specimens. They found 13 growth marks, or lags, in a Zalmoxis robustus, and 7 lags in a Zalmoxis shipororum. So they said they weren't juveniles. And lags, again, that's like the minimum age. So one was at least 13 years and one was at least seven years. Mm -hmm. However, they also found that the specimens were still actively growing when they died. So we haven't yet found a fully grown Zalmoxis. Hmm. They found that Zalmoxis had a slow growth rate. In 2012, Attila Osi and others described a rhabdodontid, the oldest known one by 15 million years that lived in the late Cretaceous in what is now Hungary. They assigned it to Machlodon verosi, and they did histology on it and compared it to Zelmoxes. And this specimen of Machlodon helps show that Zelmoxes was not a dwarf dinosaur. They found that the ancestral rhabdodontid had femur lengths of 298 to 339 millimeters, and that's close in size to the femur of Zalmoxis, which ranged from 320 to 333 millimeters. Or about a foot. 
Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Both Maklodon and Zomoxis lived on islands. However, Maklodon was even smaller. There are Maklodon specimens that are about 3.9 to 5.9 feet or 1.2 to 1.8 meters long. And they have features that indicate these specimens are adults. Oh, wow. But there are late juvenile Zalmoxi specimens that are six and a half feet or two meters long. And still growing. Mm-hmm. In 2017, Steve Brusati and others described a number of new Zalmoxi specimens. They've been found in multiple areas or localities of the Hotseg Basin. And it turns out both species of Zalmoxis lived alongside each other. And more specimens have been found over the years. And Zalmoxis is now one of the most common dinosaurs found on Hotseg Island. So most of the skeleton's been found, and we know about 80% of the skull of Zelmoxis robustus. At least 22 Zelmoxis individuals have been found in just one locality, and it might be up to 25 individuals. Wow. that's quite a bone bed. Yeah. They didn't necessarily live together, though. They were found spread throughout this locality. Okay, so maybe not. It could be multiple bone beds. Yes. Zelmoxis shiporum was named based on an incomplete adult specimen and some referred fossils. Then later, more fossils were assigned to Shapororum. However, Brusati and others said that it was hard to refer fossils to either species because many fossils that were found were disarticulated and or isolated, so it's hard to tell where exactly they belonged. Also, though the two species have unique features, it's hard to compare them to close relatives because we don't have the same bones of those close relatives to compare them to. It's also unclear if some differences between the species are because of individual variation or ontogeny, how it's growing, and it's possible that there's even sexual dimorphism, which is something that Franz Nopsha had suggested. Brusati and others said that a comprehensive revision of Zalmoxis, quote, is becoming increasingly necessary. Hmm. <laughs> and apparently this study has begun, so... For their paper, they accepted that there's two species of Zelmoxis, and they referred some specimens to each species. And they described multiple individuals. Most of them were isolated bones. They described some teeth that were larger than the holotype of Zelmoxis, which they said, quote, illustrate that Zelmoxis, or at least Zelmoxis shiporum, could reach a reasonably large size, although still much smaller than the rhabdodontid rhabdodon priscus from late Cretaceous faunas in Western Europe, end quote. So it might not be a, a small dwarf dinosaur, but it might still be small for a rhabdodontid. Yes, so not a dwarf dinosaur, but still on the smaller side. I guess that kind of, <laughs> what's your definition of dwarf? <laughs> yeah. In 2022, last year, Felix Augustin and others found two partial brain cases previously thought to be Zelmoxis to actually be Telmatosaurus. So we've got some, some things are shifting when it comes to Zelmoxis. So to recap, there's two species, Zelmoxis robustus and Zelmoxis shiporum. The second species is spelled crazy. That S-H-Q-I-P-E-R-O-R-U-M? Yes, it's named for the Albanian name for Albania. Okay, that makes sense. Yep, and that was named in 2003. I would have never guessed that that was pronounced sheep to start. Yeah, I had to look that up. And hopefully, um, I feel like I'm probably not pronouncing it 100%, but hopefully it's close. I think you did a good job. Thanks. (laughs) (laughs) I appreciate the effort. (laughs) So we know it as Zelmoxis now, but at first it was thought to be Maquadon robustum. It was described way back in 1899 by Franz Nopsha, and Nopsha referred Maquadon, an ornithopod named by H.D. Seeley that was found in Austria. He referred to part of the material as Maquadon suzai and part of it to Maquadon robustum. Then in 1915, he said that Maquadon may be the same as Rhabdodon and that the differences were from sexual dimorphism. He compared the fossils with other ornithopods from Europe and North America, like Camptosaurus, and found it to be similar to Rhabdodon, which was found in France. Then in 1990, George Olszewski corrected the name to Rhabdodon robustus. And then in 2003, Weishampel and others found enough differences to name Zalmoxis robustus. The genus name Zelmoxis refers to the Dacian deity Zelmoxis, who were treated in a crypt for three years to be resurrected on the fourth year, which is it was similar to how the fossils were liberated. Hmm. Zelmoxis was also a slave of Pythagoras, who traveled to Dacia and became a deity. 
And then the species name, of course, refers to its robust build, robustus. Although, again, ironic since the second species, Shiporum, is larger. Yeah. Zelmoxis is a super cool dinosaur name. Mm -hmm. It's also very handy if you're ever doing a A to Z list of dinosaurs to remember Zelmoxis because there aren't a ton of Z dinosaurs to choose from. And there's more than you think. <laughs> I just did a list. I guess there's like Zuni ceratops. The and stuff. one I had trouble with, surprisingly, was W. I always go to the ceratopsians because mm. isn't there Wendy ceratops? Oh, yeah. It's because I was trying to do herbivores and carnivores. So, what did you do for W carnivore? There were a couple options, but I went with the one I could find an image of, and that's Wagetosuchus. Which is a dinosaur and not a crocodilian, despite the sucus. <laughs> Yes, tetanurin theropod, but it's dubious. Uh-oh. I know, but there were pictures. I was thinking whamwaracadia, but I think that's a sauropod. Hmm. Yeah, good job. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> and our fun fact of the day is in honor of World Metrology Day. Oh. I try to do this every year. I think I've hit the last few years. <laughs> so we celebrate the anniversary of the Meter Convention of 1875. On every May 20th. Oh, now it's ringing a bell. <laughs> Originally, that meter convention was signed by 17 countries, including the United States. Essentially, all these countries agreed on using the meter for length and the kilogram for weight or mass. And obviously, the U.S. still has some work to do here. But officially, we use the meter sometimes, sort of. <laughs> sure. I didn't really start using meters until we started talking about dinosaurs. Yeah. Well, you didn't do engineering or something really science heavy in college, because mm -hmm. if you do, then most universities, even in the US, it's all SI units, meters, kilograms, amps, all that stuff. They're way better and easier to work with. <laughs> <laughs> we had a suggestion on Discord from Roadkill Pizza that we change the universal measurement system to dinosaurs. <laughs> and if we did that, we could pick holotype dinosaur bones for length and weight and all the other criteria, which could be kind of fun. Mm -hmm. It's also interesting because when the meter convention was signed, the meter and kilogram were physical objects, just like a holotype. There was like a literal, that is the meter. That's like the holotype meter, just like looking at a monosaurus and there's that one bone and it's like, okay, well, that's what defines an amonosaurus. They did the same thing with the meter. The meter holotype equivalent was called the International Prototype Meter. Oh. And from 1889 to 1960, it was a one meter long alloy of 90% platinum and 10% iridium. It's also in kind of a fancy X shape so that it doesn't twist and get distorted, which is pretty fun. The U.S. used its own precisely one meter long platinum iridium copy to define our length system. And many countries have their own national meters. This is the international prototype meter. That's like the holotype. And then there are like these copies of it, which are called the national meters. The neotypes. <laughs> kind of. <laughs> Except it didn't replace the holotype. It's more just like copies of the holotype. Lectotypes. Is that the one? Wait, no, that doesn't quite work either. Because that you choose a lectotype if there is no designated type. Okay. I'm sure there's a name out there, though, that would fit. I think copy of holotype works, too. Mm. <laughs> One of the uses of the U.S. national meter was to define a foot as exactly 0 0.3048 meters. So the foot itself is defined based on the meter. That's one <laughs> way that we're sort of on the metric system. Interesting. Yeah. And that's still the definition of a foot. Although now the meter is based on the speed of light. It's not based on this physical object. So a dinosaur option for length, instead of using meters, we could use like Sioux skulls. I was thinking would be a cool mm. holotype that a lot of people are familiar with. Because Sioux the Tyrannosaurus had a skull length of 1,394 millimeters or four foot 6.9 inches. So we could just measure things in Sioux skulls. And I think <laughs> it would be fun if every country had a copy of Sioux skull as their like national sue skull length and you could just call it skulls rather than meters if it's much smaller than the skull would you go by eye socket sue eye socket or <laughs> i think sue tooth i was thinking of like the metric convention so it would be like a milliskull and a micro skull and oh, a nano skull okay. 
But yeah, you could, I guess, come up with some really crazy combination like that. So if we use our favorite titosaurus as examples, Ankylosaurus would be six to seven skulls long, and Apatosaurus would be about 15 to 16 skulls long. <laughs> <laughs> it kind of gives you a good comparison between different dinosaurs, especially if they're coexisting with T-Rex and it's something that it might have bit at, the comparison to its head. The kilogram was also a physical object for a long time. It was called the international prototype of the kilogram. Not surprising. <laughs> nope. <laughs> Starting in 1889, it was a cylinder of the same platinum iridium alloy as the international prototype meter. The kilogram is much smaller. It's about the size of a golf ball. Part of the reason they use platinum iridium is because it's so dense. In this case, the U.S. has four national copies, and one pound is defined as exactly 0.4535923737 kilograms. Take that pi number. <laughs> Actually, it's much shorter. Yeah. <laughs> Not infinite. It's only eight digits. Mm -hmm. But I think it's funny because even though we pretend in the US like we're not on the metric system, we basically are. We just have this like weird conversion that we use for metric and call our own units, just like if we were using skulls. <laughs> Maybe I'm too used to our system so I can understand it versus in skulls. It would take me some practice. Yeah. It definitely takes work when you're transferring from one unit system to another. So one dinosaur option for weight I came up with is instead of a kilogram or maybe a gram, we could use a dinosaur tooth because dinosaur teeth are ubiquitous and the enamel is fairly hardy, so it could be a decent choice for not changing over time. Mm -hmm. I had a really hard time, though, finding a published weight of any dinosaur teeth. People are way more concerned with length measurements. Yeah, and, and the serrations. The denticles, all the details. Yes. <laughs> I think that's because the weight of a modern tooth after going through the fossilization process has very little to do with what the tooth would have originally weighed mm. because a lot of the minerals have been replaced or eaten away or who knows what. So weighing it just doesn't really matter that much. Fortunately, the one and only real dinosaur fossil that we have is a Spinosaurus tooth <laughs> we bought at a museum in Japan. Did you weigh it? I did, yes. <laughs> How much was it? So it's almost as big as my thumb, but it only weighs 7.4 grams. It's pretty hmm, light. That is light. Yeah, when, and when you hold it, you're like, wow, that is extremely light. So we could pick a similar tooth as a holotype and just call the unit teeth. So we'd have skulls and teeth to mm -hmm. go together. Using our favorite dinosaurs as examples, Ankylosaurus would weigh about one mega tooth. Huh? Like how there's megabytes. Oh. Be, when you go beyond kilo, you get to okay. mega. I was like, did you size up the teeth and I didn't realize? <laughs> There's a million teeth right about. And an apatosaurus would weigh about 5.5 .5 mega teeth. Yep. I mean, I can't wrap my head around what a mega tooth weighs, but I know it's much bigger than an ankylosaurus. I mean, it's kind of like a ton, right? You know, it's like a whole bunch of yeah. a smaller unit or even a kilogram. But obviously... We should not do this <laughs> because fundamental physics are a much better use for defining measurements. All right, I just got used to kilograms. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the reason that they picked the iridium platinum alloy was because it's really stiff and chemically stable. It probably doesn't need to be said, but fossils are not particularly strong physically or chemically, so they would definitely change over time and it would screw up the whole measurement system. Since 1983, the meter has been defined as the length of the path traveled by light in vacuum during a time interval of 1,299,792,458 of a second. Very precise. Yes, it's very specific. The crazy number was picked to be as close as possible to previous definitions of the meter. And also, they use like a cesium rate, so it's just... It's convenient, apparently. It's better than having a physical object that changes because the speed of light in a vacuum doesn't change. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't require keeping any type specimens, so that's nice. That type kilogram was used for even longer. It was used for 130 years, all the way up until 2019. But they decided to change it because the weight was changing on these different kilograms. They think maybe it was absorbing minute amounts of mercury vapor from the air or something. Hmm. And they were changing differently. Like some of them got a little bit lighter. Some of them got a tiny bit heavier. And so using that definition of a kilogram was tricky. So since 2019, the kilogram has been defined in terms of 
Planck's constant, the speed of light, and that frequency of cesium-133, which sounds really complicated, but it gives more precise and repeatable results, which is why they did it. Science. Yes. <laughs> Science is all about precise and repeatable results. Yep. But if you really want, if you want to have fun, you could talk about things being weighed in mega teeth or kilo teeth <laughs> and length estimates and skulls. I'm glad we don't do that, though. Me too. <laughs> Thanks to the meter convention. Happy <laughs> World Metrology Day. Good for you for remembering it every year. Because <laughs> I did not. <laughs> and that wraps up this episode of Ino Dino. Thank you so much for listening. Stay tuned. Next week, we will be talking about, we often have mentioned the dinosauroid, but we'll be diving deep into it. The dinosauroid. Because it's based on a dinosaur, the dinosaur of the day for next episode. If you don't know what the dinosauroid is, you're in for a treat. Yes. And we've got some news items that go along with the theme very nicely. If you want to check out links to the sources that we talked about in today's episode, then head over to inodino.com in our show notes. Thanks again, and until next time. Good day.